prosaic, prose, process, procedure, poetry. Stand back, observe, repeat. Each element align, realign, and realign. The course above, align, realign, and realign. E. E. Cummings was a poet who famously eliminated capitals, punctuation, elaboration. The Japanese have haiku, common words, uncommonly assembled. Humble materials, poetically assembled. Monica Ponce de Leon and her partner, Nadia Terrani, have based their practice on the rigorous assembly of materials, evolving figurative geometry from carefully calibrated operation which, bit by bit, like a drawing by Asher, evolved into columns, walls, opening, a whole vocabulary. Monosyllabic, yet expressive. Exploring limits, yet pragmatic and rigorous. When you start to imagine what a brick can do in their hands, you realize that Monica and Tirani have employed every device in their arsenal. Their firm office DA has made a specialty of exploring the outer limits of materials from traditional to new in their quest to produce impeccably crafted and detailed buildings envelope and evocative subtle interiors. These elaborate, unrelenting, inexorable investigations in the form of designs for furniture, buildings, and experimental structures have forged an important step in the search for a link between the digital world and the material world, uniting traditional craft and technology to quite disparate fields in a manner that preserve and enhance the integrity of each. By aggregating forms with paradigm borrowed from other disciplines, Monica and Tirani are able to construct an evocative space with techniques such as weaving, darting, folding, stacking, you name it. All of these techniques for material which in other hands are often static, ponderous, and quite unyielding. Since its founding, Office DA has received more professional and design awards than any young firm that I know of. To name a few, they received the Hardison Parker Medal, and very, very early in the award uh, in architecture from the American Academy of uh, Arts and Letters. <coughs> Equally early, the Cooper Human National Design Awards, and I'm counting, 11 Progressive Architecture Design Awards. So now when you think that the firm was only established in 1991, I think that is quite an achievement. It's very impressive. It has been some time since we've heard about their recent work, especially since actually last time when Monica was here, that was I think summer 2002. Um, and now that um, she has been recently appointed to be the dean at the School of Architecture at the University of Michigan, we certainly will be seeing a new chapter in her work. So please welcome. Monica Ponce de Leon.
So as Ming just mentioned, I got here in 2002, and it has been fantastic to see the school evolve so rapidly under Eric's vision and with Ming and Chris's leadership among amazing faculty. So I'm a little bit nervous because I'm actually among some of my favorite architects, so you'll forgive me if I stumble tonight. Now, during my visit in 2002, Eric really challenged me to think differently, to teach differently, and to begin to question the mode of uh, working that we have been operating under. So, during my time here, my work with the students was quite intense. In many ways, uh, we failed. But actually, in this failure, I think that the time I hired for me was very transformative, in that it allowed me to redefine my voice and to find, to allow me to think about what am I really passionate about and then how to pursue it. So when I lectured in 2002, I entitled the lecture um, Zero Tolerances which was really the beginning of me thinking about the relationship between digital fabrication and craft. And for me, there, there is a section there, over time I have come to realize that I actually do not see a dichotomy between digital fabrication and craft, but I actually see them to be one and the same. Now, tolerance, of course, is a term used in building to account for the error of the human hand and we build to half inch tolerance, or to four inch tolerance, or to eight inch tolerance, depending on the field, depending on the trade. Um, so during the lecture, I was exploring the idea that digital fabrication may actually um, present the possibility of producing perfect figures, but only, of course, to discover the impossibility of such a perfection. So, for example, in 1996, when we were commissioned by the Museum of Modern Art in New York to do this installation in their garden, we were fascinated with the idea of working with sheet steel um, and laser cutting it, what was then a relatively new um, technology. Even though it's been around since the 50s, we were only unaware of its uh, presence. So we were interested in developing a piece that could climb over a wall, and for that we had to give it legs, like stalactites or stalagmites, and allow it to become some sort of a billboard beyond. But most importantly, we explored the notion of building an almost like origami, from flattened sheets, flattened sheets of steel that then could be folded into shape. More rigid at the bottom so that people could sit, but ultimately broken into smaller segments that then needed to be joined together through the folds. The technique is not different than what you see when you make boxes when you're moving, the kind of sort of slit cut out of cardboard to ease it so that you can give way to the fold in it. So this notion of the fold as something that reinforces was for us the prevailing um, analogy or the prevailing technique that we use in this installation. Now, unlike a cardboard box, because steel, the steel that we were using was an eighth of an inch, our slits could not be aligned, they needed to be offset. And that offset was precisely calibrated again to be an eighth of an inch, so that the material would give way and you could actually fold it by hand. Now, because we were working with laser cutting, that allowed us to be precise. And it allowed us to en enact an old age fantasy of ours of producing something that may have a weird shape, but that from a single point of view could actually be reconstituted as a flat plane. This is, of course, just a ruse, because embedded within this flatness is the three-dimensionality three of the actual object. Now, Precision needed to be calibrated in this case by things like the door of the um, steel fa uh, fabrication shop. 
it needed to be predicated on the reinforcement of the piece so that it could travel to the site. And it needed to account for its assembly on the street behind the museum. Now, much to our dismay, these pieces that have been pre-cut, pre-assembled, pre-measured, did actually not fit together. And I think you can probably see here the slit, and then here the slit as how they did not fit. We spent hours scratching our heads, um, about to have a heart attack because the rental of the crane was about to expire, and the permit from the city of New York to close the street behind the museum was about to expire. Um, and it took us a long time and a lot of wine over lunch to realize that the problem was the street was not flat. <laughs> so while our piece was perfect and straight, the surroundings were not flat. The irony of that is that we had already anticipated that the site conditions will not be precise, and we had allocated for a, a slip joint in all of the columns that supported the piece, understanding that once it was into place, the ground underneath it would not be level. But we were unable to anticipate the street where the two halves would then be joined. So, I tell the little story because it leads me to believe that in fact in architecture there might be nothing but approximations. And approximations, approximation is uh, for me a very interesting term because in mathematics it's actually the inexact representation of something close enough to be useful. And it seems to me that in architecture all what that we do is actually search for those approximations. The presence, for example, of a hand when opening a set of drawings, and it's something that can then lead to a reverberation on a surface that is somehow the result tangentially of the need for that hand to open the drawer itself. And how that can translate, depending on how you orient your material, on a topography, a topography that may be analogous to a site, or a topography that may be analogous to the act of making, or a topography that may be analogous to simply a landscape. And this contradiction between something that looks carved, making reference to craft, but also mechanical, the fact that we're carving out of plywood, there might be nothing more mechanical than plywood, and this cross-section between a natural material wood that then is treated um, by machines in different versions before and after. So when we did this house in um, New England, we were obsessed with the relationship between the configuration of the building and its dissonance with the site. And that tension between the site and the program and led us to a figure that forced a rupture on the skin of the building. In the ground level, a kitchen with a family room. In the upper level, a living room that got great views of woods beyond. And then a staircase that somehow stitched them together. But a staircase that had to move away because of the presence of a hallway. So for us, that hallway pushing the staircase away produced a delamination of the wall a delamination that exposed, in a way, the guts of the building. And in that exposure, a skin that was meant to just be simple and single became then severed, almost like a gash. Now, the technique that allowed us to pursue a figure of this kind within a reasonable budget turns out to, turns out to be digital technology. Our experience with digital technology has been that it actually makes things affordable rather than more expensive. So that all of the components that you see on the curve were digitally fabricated. And what is interesting is that they become the jig for the production of the wall itself. <coughs> the technique at the end is not very different from 19th century techniques of making boats. It's just that the tools and the equipment are different. This allowed us to produce, again, fantasies such as tilting a wall above the headroom of um, the user. 
always taking into account how it is to be fabricated on site. So while we think of technology as advanced, the nitty gritty reality is that it is hands that actually put it together. In this particular project, we were lucky to be able to indulge on the transgression from one field to another. There was a value engineering of the project in midstream, and we were uh, asked to eliminate copper. And what we came up with was to replace the copper with EPDM, because rubber roofing is the cheapest material, one buck and 20 cents, that you can find in the market. So our fascination was how do we then transform the material and use it, not through architectural techniques, since we no longer were using it as a roof, we felt that architecture did not suffice. And instead, we looked to tailoring techniques. I learned this stuff from nuns when I was in Catholic school, so I've always had this fascination with how to actually put things together. Um, so we looked at tailoring techniques as hints, as ways of um, informing how to put the building together. And of course, what is fascinating, fascinating is that when you take techniques from one field to another, it actually leaves, um, it actually precludes precision, and it forces a loose fit. Full-scale mock-ups, actually one-fifth scale mock-ups made by us, which is what you see here, and then a full-scale mock-up made by the builder. Now, what is interesting about the project for me is that it is precisely constructed but actually by the wrong people. The roofers refused to warrant the facade, so the builder actually had his own carpenters constructed. So you actually have untrained labor, labor that should not be doing this work, figuring out how to precisely enact it. And you can see here the fussy line where the roofers finished and where the carpenters <coughs> began. Also interesting to me is that to produce the effect of precision, we had to construct a corset around the windows to hold the rubber in place. Because in the translation from a dress to a building, the same techniques, again, do not stand. It's not very different than what we do with boats when you apply fiberglass to the boat. The difference is in our case, we didn't want to paint the rubber. In a boat, you then spray it, and it, it, the joints, the messy joints disappear which forced a calibration of the joint and a redesign of the joint so that it would have the semblance of a precise line. Shift in scale forces different shift in detailing, but also the increasingly complex configuration of buildings creates frictions and creates resistances that, in my mind, muddy up the waters in interesting ways because it precludes easy solutions and easy answers. We were asked to design a soccer stadium, a small soccer stadium, only 2,000 seats, uh, for the city of St. Paul. And what was interesting is that very quickly this stereotypical version of the stadium with the field in the center and the creatures around it became an impossibility. Today's stadiums are messy programs that have a lot of support structures like stores, like fitness centers, like hotels, and they make a mess of what used to be typologically pure. So, for example, because it's an urban stadium, at the ground level we needed to fit shops. We also had to calibrate a myriad of access in relationship to streets and then visual connections from public spaces and a visual connection from the highway. But perhaps the quirkiest limitation was that we were in the landing path of a plane, which I hope, yeah, you can see. Which meant that our uh, roof line had a very definite boundary, and a boundary that was not coplanar with the ground. To make matters even more complicated, the owner wanted the stadium to have a hotel, which meant that if we wanted to take, if we wanted to do a 2,000 uh, seat stadium, we then needed to take those seats that were displaced by the hotel, and we needed to relocate them on the west 
some. Needless to say, that produced very interesting and strange relationships and formal uh, traumatic encounters. But also, it, it allowed other programs to then invade the building underneath us, that high end of the bleachers. So it meant that rather than doing one section and then repeating it at infinitum, we ended up with a building that had to somehow reconcile itself from being building hotel to being conventional bleachers with everything in between. The client was very clear that he wanted a homogeneous single identity to the project. So techniques of collage or even montage were completely eliminated from the outset. And instead, our research worked on how to develop a skin system that would actually take on the different um, programmatic requirements. On the one hand, for example, the idea of viewing, viewing through the building, viewing out from the building, viewing at the building. We needed to develop a skin that would allow, for example, for a long slip that would let you look at the practice soccer field. Or a skin that could then comfortably receive windows for, a hotel, for the hotel itself so you don't have guests looking through a screen. So we worked with shingling, but shingling expanded to a massive scale. And we work with shingling because, of course, historically it allows for a myriad of geometric transformations. But also it allows us to expand the shingle as a way of introducing conventional puncture windows. The technique is not very different from what Paco Rabanne did when he went ahead and increased the size of the sequence on a dress so that it would still configure to the female figure but in a very jarring and disproportionate scale. The joint itself for us was a challenge in that we needed a joint that would allow flexible movement and flexible transformation. So we looked very closely at armory, for example, and in particular Korean armory, as a way of understanding how to pin our shingles together. And ultimately, the challenge was to produce a building that would transform along its length while still retaining continuity. In the case of the hotel, they expand apart, almost like, like when you shred a sequence dress, so that we could then insert conventional hotel windows. It was also important for us that the roof and the wall be a single system, since the roof height was varying throughout, and our section was varying throughout. And most telling was the transformation of the facade because of the presence of a ramp that connected, an exit ramp that connected all levels. A ramp that actually can deliver over the sidewalk. So we needed for the skin to be able to respond for this kind of programmatic impairment. Now, after my um, installation here at SIRC, I was asked to, um, I was offered the opportunity to do a, a series of research projects at Georgia Tech. I received what is called the Venture Led Chair in Architecture, which is a very nice um, grant program. And I decided to concentrate on the use of digital technology, taking advantage of their facilities, which at the, at the, at the time were really ahead of everybody else in the country. So with the taste of my, what I consider my failure at SIRE, I decided to do five installations. So you would think that having one failure here would mean that I would be a little bit more, um, I don't know, cautious. And instead, I guess I wanted to prove something, so I went in the opposite direction. And I'm not gonna show all of them, but I wanna give you a flavor of what we did. So working with students over a one year long uh, process, we looked at the relationship between making uh, digitally and its um, ten the tension between that and the presence of the hand. So for example, in this case, we worked with the notion of casting acrylic and producing the maximum number of, of variations or the effect of variation by agglomerating 10 different sections. In this particular case, 
we were working with the notion of a tectonic unit that has a joint in itself and that can be lifted by two people as a way of producing a sitting area out of just seven different components. So the joint becomes the element that holds everything together. And the relationship between geometry and joint is actually what gives the piece stability. Another investigation was very simple, which is just to cut shapes out of plywood and try to figure out how to line an existing uh, atrium in the architecture building at Georgia Bank. This was over 40 feet uh, in height. Constructed, all of them constructed by students and by me, so very, very low skilled labor. And in this case, we wanted to explore the notion of uh, the joint as a, not only as a guide for the construction, but also as a simple way to, um, to produce a shape. So we did a finger joint that is half carved out of the piece itself. And one of my favorite moments during the entire uh, process is this particular image. And what you're looking at here is that when we lay the joint in the computer, when we actually drew it on the piece, we made a mistake and we flipped it. Which meant that this entire line was incorrect and we did not have time for um, recutting. We, were running, we ran out of time because we had one week that we could do the installation during spring break when school was closed. So the crew had to go back and cut by hand all of these pieces and then staple them together. Now, what I like about that is that it immediately exposes the lack of distance between fabricating something um, with the aid of the computer and what you, of course, do by hand. So this kind of research has, of course, had an impact on our practice and has informed us in terms of what we do in the field. We developed the different joints, and I'm sorry you cannot see it in this image, but we developed the different joints that could be flipped um, as a means of producing this interior for a restaurant in Boston. Working with the problem of existing mechanical spaces against the ceiling, we line the space with uh, pre-cut pieces of uh, plywood that allow things like mechanical, uh, like sprinklers, like lighting, mechanical systems, etc., to stay in the space, but also start to veil certain programs, like the, the wine uh, storage, and allow us to deal with existing columns in the space that in our minds were sort of out, of, out of place. So bellies and peaks and valleys are the direct response to the existing mechanical conditions in the room. Now, we have been known for the aggregation of particular elements and a certain obsession with aggregation and assembly. So when we were commissioned by this client to do a dining and a survey for their headquarters, um, we purposefully selected a material that would preclude aggregation by working with plaster. So rather than work with tectonic units that have a language of their own or a language that we could make up, in our case, the project then became the hiding of elements and the hiding of scenes. So everything came down to a three and a half inch crack. Lighting, return air, supply air, sprinkler heads, camera, and microphones. Everything is operating within that Now what enables those gaps to function is two final types. One that to receive an acoustical material, wasophon, and the other one to just be plastered over. 
And in order to hide the difference in texture of the wasatone, which is not actually very nice when you look at it, we did two different uh, textures to the plaster, so that you end up with three, um, you end up with three different variations in terms of tone and light reflectivity. And we felt that that was a way of approximating homogeneity, actually through variation. Now, a lot of the projects that I have shown deal with surfaces and explore the digital fabrication almost in a cop-out way by just simply dealing with that surface. So we were very interested in seeing if we could translate that technique or use the technology to actually produce three-dimensionality. And we were commissioned by Rodana School of Design to remodel an existing banking home into um, um, into their new library by moving the library from its on-campus location to downtown, um, downtown Providence. The banking hall is in the National Register of Historic Places, so for us it was important to place the needed functions like circulation island, the circulation uh, functions, for example, or study carols and study rooms, almost as floating objects in the space. The intention was that they would somehow keep good company with the existing space, uh, but have a language of their own. We also thought of them as a way of calibrating a different relationship <coughs> to space and a different relationship to study. In the center, we wanted a lounge that was almost like the living room of the building. And then on top of the study island, we were dealing with very large tables where students could actually copy uh, details from books. Greece still has a very classical approach towards uh, uh, teaching from Wayne. But it also gave the students a different relationship to the room itself because it gave you a higher um, level view of what had only been seen from the ground. In order to be able to come within budget and on time, everything was prefabricated off-site. The uh, mill shop company used our digital files as a way of producing all of the pieces. And what was interesting is that we took our 3D model, we flattened them, gave them the flattened pieces. Those were routed, assembled into blocks, boxes, and then those were brought to the site and then bolted together. So the actual assembly on site happened rather fast. We thought of this as an opportunity to work with variation. The machine doesn't cut what, doesn't care what shape or what size is cutting. I don't have to tell you guys that. So we thought that it would be a unique opportunity to create infinite possibilities. And more specifically, we thought that we could use this as a way of exploring issues of universal design. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with this term, universal design, but I actually find it, in a nerdy way, very fascinating. Universal design is a critique of the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. Americans with Disabilities Act thinks of people as able and disabled. Universal design actually thinks of people as having a range of abilities, which means that rather than working with an average, or trying to address only the disabled, universal design thinks that you should work with a range. So in a very didactic way, for the study island, we were working with the smallest seated size, which is the seated female, and then at the other end, working with the tallest size, which is the standing male, and of course, everything in between. For the island that has study carols around them, we want it to be actually much more subtle. So no two seats are the same height, not two tables are the same height, no seats are not two seats are the same depth, not two tables are the same depth, etc. With the intention that over time students will find that study carol that is comfortable to them. This is a captive audience, the students that are raised for four or five years. So students will be coming back to the library over and over again and they may actually find that spot that somehow feels right. But also the intention was to facilitate either one, two, or three people sitting together in different spots, depending on their size. 
Now, as a result of the fabrication method, we did not do shop drawings. Our shop drawings were really guides for assembly. Instead, what we did were digital files that were used by the mill shop company, but the mill shop company retained liability. The conventional process, of course, is that a mill shop, mill shop uh, company produces the shop drawings, gives them to the architect, the architect retains them, and then sends them back. In this case, in a way, we inverted the relationship. We gave them our digital files, they reviewed them for errors, they caught the errors, they sent them back to us and asked us to correct them. And in that way, they retained the library so that if they didn't catch an error, they were liable. So, in terms of um, guide for assembly, we didn't do every single element. We actually just did element types. So that there was 40, I think it was about 48 of these guides. So we didn't do 40 sheets, we did one that represented all of them. Again, the machine doesn't care what shape it's cutting. What, what you care about is that the person that is assembling it is assembling the same number of pieces in the same manner. Digital technology also allowed us to customize the uh, piece by introducing perforation in the form of words. The librarians were very keen in including the names of authors and the names of artists and the names of alumni into the library. So what we did is that we developed um, an alphabet uh, so that we could get pricing on how many letters would be possible. And um, pricing allowed for 32,000 characters. So we told the librarians to come up with a list of 32,000 characters. So when you look at the final piece, um, what is interesting is that the history of the place is embedded within it because they mixed in names of alums, but they also mixed in names of people from our office and even the names of my dogs. <laughs> that can transform, a unit that is transformable. And when we were asked to design this gas station, originally for uh, BP, for Beyond Technology, and now it's an ARCO station, we were given a very strange challenge. We were asked to renovate or remodel this existing gas station um, that had an existing canopy. But yet the code, required us actually to extend the canopy beyond its current boundary. So the funny shape you see is actually the result of us trying to respond to code while still maintaining the original structure of members and extending them beyond their original lines. We were very lucky that the, um, that the gas station had this billboard. The billboard was original and that that would actually further pressure on the figure and on the completeness of the figure. This was intended to be a prototype that would then have uh, iterations, one in Chicago and one in Germany, in Berlin. So we worked with the notion of it made out of components and components that were derivatives of a single element. The idea being that if we design a particular mushroom uh, cladding in such a way that it would be transformable, you could actually address multiple site conditions, multiple vehicular conditions, and multiple programmatic conditions, irregardless of what city or what site you were at. So the column is designed so that it can, um, so that it can be modified to even encase the booth where you pay for your gas. And I'm just gonna switch, I mean, through, through the slides. You get the picture. Now, there's something um, for, for me deeply unsatisfactory about the project that is just a cladding project. 
Um, so when we were asked to design um, land port of entry, I love these terms. I always get them wrong, but I love them anyways. A land port of entry for the uh, United States government, we thought that this would be a great opportunity to take this idea a little further and actually work with the notion of a structural element that would transform according to the vicissitudes of the site and the program. We are we're working on Madawaska, which is the most uh, northern point port of entry in the United States. And it's a stretch site because the bridge that board crosses from Canada actually does not lead directly to the site. You sort of have to take a detour before you get to the site itself. The other peculiarity is that it's an inclined site. It's not a flat site, which proposes a huge problem in terms of vehicles. Because when you wait in line, of course, you want to be as flat as possible to avoid accidents in terms of ice and snow. So given the tilt of the site and how it had to actually relate to flat planes, we struggled to actually uh, design the project. Vehicles really run the day. Now, when we started, because it's a project for the General Service Administration, we wanted a rectangular building. We thought, OK. It has to be the most dumb building possible. And we try very, very hard to do something really simple, like a square box. But it was really impossible to do something, quote unquote, simple. So the resultant figure is really the, is really the, um, the child, if you wish, of the tension between that inclined topography and all of the prerequisites of commercial traffic on this side, uh, privately owned vehicles on this side, and then outbound versus inbound traffic. Government projects, therefore, very low budget. We cannot afford huge retaining walls. So the whole site became a mediation of landscape with very slow, very small slopes. And this is something that translated into the building itself. So from one end of the building to the other end of the building, there is a four foot drop. And what we decided to do was use it to our advantage, allowing to connect views from one end of the site to the other for safety reasons. This is a facility that needs to be operated by two men at night, so the visual connection between them, as well as clear view of the inspection, primary inspection and secondary inspection was paramount. Now, the building from tip to tip is 800 feet long. And the height of the building, in average, is 12 feet. So what do you do? How do you make architecture of something that is really longer than a strip mall and the same height as a strip mall? So we decided to work with the notion of just a simple crenellation, and a crenellation that then would become distorted according to the different height requirements, like trucks are 16 feet tall, so the canon is going to be 16 feet tall. And it's in that crenellation, that simple figure of that profile, that the building attempts to have some sort of pattern. Now, because the design process is extremely complex with many constituencies and the program is constantly changing and the site was so um, difficult to negotiate, we decided to, des we decided to design uh, two elements and two elements that could transform in relationship to each other, a heat proof and a mushroom column. So the project works with the notion that one element can transform into the other and that the roof is and the canopy is the result of this kind of negotiation. I'm sorry, the animations are really clicky today. We were asked to enter a competition with a developer. It's a competition that we won, but that did not get built, to design a mixed-use building 
with a very strange program in my mind. It's, it was a little bit of a shopping mall with conference facilities, with an aquatic center, and with some uh, housing outside of uh, Kuwait. The project has the same size as the conference uh, center in Boston. So it's not large enough to be understood as a part of a city, but also too large to be uh, a building in itself. So it occupies a sort of strange uh, in-between space, very similar perhaps to something like the Escorial. So we work with, we look very closely at soups as a model, not only because we had a commercial program, but also because soups tend to operate in the same fashion. They're somehow buildings, but also um, fragments of cities in themselves. And in particular, when looking at the souks, we wanted to understand the relationship between the structural systems of the souk and the geometry that makes the coffering. And these geometries are extremely precise with very interesting repercussions in terms of spans and interesting repercussions in terms of distances. So that relationship between geometry and structure is something that became a driver in the project. And in particular, our structural engineer came in with this notion, which we uh, find fascinating, or of a, tra of a tra tra trabecular, <laughs> trabecular structure, which is, it, it, which is a, stru it's a component of bones, and it's a component of bones that changes density depending on what part of your body it is. So, for example, the one on the right-hand side is the top of a hip, the one on the left-hand side is actually part of your cervix. And you can see how very different, even though they're in the mid-area of your body, how very different they are from each other. So we were interested in this idea of a structural system, a coffering system, a porous system that will be very different depending on the structural forces acting upon it. And we thought of that as a way of mediation between the different kinds of spaces in the building. Um, such as, for example, the kind of long span that was required by the aquatic center. Again, a very strange program. Um, and it led us to believe that we could actually change the geometry of the coffers depending on of the figures of the programs that it was supposed to house. So, for instance, when looking at the theaters, we began to work with a triangular system that then transformed into a rectangular model. And each of these systems then help, gain, help give um, a different character to each of the programs while still maintaining continuity in terms of um, the, the experience and the image of the book. This led us to research the sort of the particular possibility of coffering as being irregular in shape and an irregularity that would allow, for example, to nest cones in different orientations and how the changing of the orientation will enable one particular structural system over another, in this case, let's say, an, a, a, a dome, a, dome, a sphere that can be split into a dome. And we began to work with the Voronoid, a Voronoid script, as a way of manipulating a rectangular a square into a rectangular system that then transformed across a field. Now, the Institute of Contemporary Art asked us to do an installation at George's Island, which is in the middle of the Boston Bay, and we chose to do it in this powder house. Um, and to actually place something in its interior. So we were working with the idea of something that needed to prefabricate, be prefabricated and placed on a boat. So we developed this, um, in a way, jellyfish to be caught in the powder house as a way of testing notions about the structural differentiation. So the same element at one end acts as a wall and at the other end acts as a dome with the transformation calibrated in between. So the jellyfish, in a way, becomes an activator for the space. 
and is the result of that cellular structure. A script allowed us to produce each of the cells um, so that it could be uh, produced with a water jet, but also it, placed the, it allowed us to easily place the holes for its hand assembly. Shortly after, we used the same technique to then do another version uh, in China. So as you can see, there are different versions of the same idea, always trying to approximate a particular figure. And I think I'll stop here. And I would love questions. Thank you.